Yeah, hello. This is the panel of the Global Manufacturing and Industrialization Summit Hydrogen. My name is Holger Lösch. I'm Deputy Director General of the BDI, the Federation of German Industries, and I'm very glad to have you all in this panel discussion. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the members of our panel, and I'd like to start with Kirsten Westphal. Kirsten Westphal uh, is the Senior Associate for Global Issues at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, and she has always also been appointed as a member of the National Hydrogen Council of Germany. And um, well, she's probably uh, one of the persons I know which is uh, uh, so deeply rooted into the geopolitics of energy, and I'm looking forward to her um, input. Uh, the second I, I would like to introduce is Mr. Armin Schnettler. He is the CEO of New Energy Business of Siemens Energy in Germany, and he is one of the leading experts on power to gas technologies and um, has been with hydrogen issue for a very, very long time. And last but not least, I would like to introduce from a very far away uh, from a German perspective, from Australia, Daniel Mills. Daniel Mills is Product Manager Hydrogen and Clean Energy at Linde Australia, and he's joined us from Australia today. And I'm glad to have you here because Australia is going to play a major role in the future discussions about hydrogen. Well, uh, to start, um, electricity from renewable resources will probably be the most important thing for um, climate protection in the future. But on the other hand, uh, to reach the Paris Agreement's climate targets, there has to be uh, more uh, look at the green molecule because the world not only runs on electricity, largely the world and especially industry runs on molecules, on gases and fuels. And therefore, um, we see now after especially Europe headed to a, a climate neutrality target 2050, we see much more emphasis on uh, hydrogen and its derivatives and um, for German industry and other heavy industries around the globe, if we want to reach these climate targets, hydrogen and its derivatives will be crucial to reach these targets and still be a vital industry. And therefore, um, we wanted to use this panel to discuss about all the aspects of the upcoming um, global um, hydrogen economy. Uh, let me start with a question to Armin Edler. So Armin, uh, Siemens is, is of course one of the, the oldest and uh, most renowned German companies with, which are huge global footprint. Uh, and uh, Siemens has always been on the forefront of technology. Uh, on the other hand, Siemens as well as your uh, division, uh, Siemens Energy, um, is into fossil industries as well, fossil energy. Uh, so what is from your industry experience and from your perspective, uh, what is this new thing about hydrogen about? Is it a, a hype, as people always say, or is now a much more coordinated and global approach towards the green molecules? Yeah, Holger, thanks a lot. I mean, uh, definitely hydrogen, the topic itself is a hype. I mean, on, on a global scale, right? I mean, there is no day uh, without any additional announcement. Uh, Siemens Energy, I mean, Siemens, of course, as we know, is, is very renowned, very old, and Siemens Energy is becoming the new player in the market. We are covering the whole value chain from, I mean, electricity generation production to the applications. What is, what is new with Siemens Energy, with the energy play, playground here is that in addition to our, say, I would say the traditional business, which is on power generation, which is on oil and gas, which we call now industrial applications, uh, we have the system integration, the transmission business. This is the classical business. And on top of that, we have the green businesses. Uh, the first one is our majority share in the Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energies, which is all about green electrons. 
And in addition to that, because we do believe that decarbonization of all sectors are not only related to green electricity, it is also related, the sector coupling topic, to green molecules. So today, approximately, say, 20, 25% of the final energy consumption is electrical energy, which can be more easily, um, say, be decarbonized by wind, solar, water, etc. And this may increase up to, say, 40, 45, maybe even up to 50%. But this leaving room for at least 50% of final energy consumption, which cannot easily be decarbonized, the sector coupling, coupling. And for that, we need green molecules. And this is why Siemens Energy has put, in addition to the traditional business, a new segment, which is called new energy business, which is headed by, by myself, and which focus is the hydrogen economy, everything around the, the hydrogen of the future. Thank you. Um, Daniel, so you are joining us from Australia. Uh, we had the, the privilege to, be, to go to Australia here for a week and have numerous talks on, on hydrogen. So basically, Australia is known as a very fossil country. So it's about coal, it's about iron ore, and it's about gas. Um, and um, but what we met there is a, a huge interest in, well, the, the future of renewable energy and uh, hydrogen from renewables, as people would say in Australia. So from um, your industry perspective, Linde is, uh, I have to add, Linde is a German company. Uh, now um, it's merged with uh, Prax Air. So it's a, always been a, a large global player. Um, basically, it's a global uh, company as Siemens is. Uh, and you have a huge interest in Australia as well. So from your uh, industry or business perspective, how would you how would you describe the discussion and the situation uh, in Australia on hydrogen? Um, thanks for the question. That's great. Yes, I am. Um, I'm really excited to be here representing you know that Asia Pacific view of uh, of the developing hydrogen market and especially for Lindy, which has such a, a wide variety of technology it can offer in the hydrogen space. Um, to your question, you know you're, you're talking about um, what we have here in Australia and, and what trends we're seeing, we've really seen the rise of renewables over the last 10 years. Um, what we're talking about is greater than 70% of the electricity being brought onto our grid is renewables. And what was, what that has solved is obviously a carbon problem, but at the same time, it's created its own problem with this double duck curve uh, uh, phenomenon where we see larger amounts of energy available in the middle of the day but where the users want them to, at the beginning and the ends of the day, we're unable to uh, deliver that energy. So we, we still re heavily rely on those fossil fuels. What I find really exciting about hydrogen is its ability to shift that energy in both time and in space um, to kind of provide the energy when the user requires it. And, and you know, as Lindy with the technologies to both store and transport um, that energy, I think it's a really exciting to be uh, both in this company and, and in this geography. Perhaps one more question. Um, what do you see from other companies? Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of companies in, in Australia are, are making a very good business on, on um, more fossil uh, creation chains. Uh, so what do you see uh, moving in the, in the business community? How is the approach? How are companies uh, looking at these new opportunities? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, many of the um, existing companies are using, you know, their existing portfolios and flexing those into what are going to be great renewable portfolios in the future. Um, I think a good example, and, and to use one of the, the harder to decarbonize industries as an example, is some of the work we've seen being hap seen happening in New Zealand. We've partnered with uh, our, a long-term partner for steel creation, New Zealand Steel, and we're actually providing them with the green hydrogen they require to help the start the process of creating green steel in that, that uh, geography and you know, using that to export to the rest of the world as well. So let me bring in Kirsten. Kirsten, you, you've been following the geopolitics of energy for, for quite a, a long time. Uh, but geopolitics of energy has always been geopolitics of power. 
Um, if you look at the developing situation right now, how would you describe the impact of, of the hydrogen issue in those global geopolitics of energy? Oh, this is a very huge question and not an easy one. I mean, what we're seeing in the geopolitics of energy transformation is, first of all, that the renewable energy generation is, is already changing the picture and growing electrification. Um, and hydrogen is now coming in. And what we're seeing is that we see a development of new value chains, bringing in new actors, bringing in new countries, bringing in new opportunities. But at the same time, it also means to transform and, and um, defossilize or decarbonize our energy value chains. And this, of course, on the other hand, creates losers. And this is, this is really a challenge on the geopolitical side. So we're seeing the roles of states changing. We're seeing also the challenge to co-opt the losers of the game. So the, the so-called petrostates, fossil fuel producers, um, and this, I think, is extremely important also to move forward with hydrogen um, because you want to keep the consensus on the Paris Agreement. So I think hydrogen gives us the big chance to also co-opt countries like Saudi Arabia, Russia, which may see some business cases in the newly developing value chain of hydrogen. Well, we've been talking about, or you've been talking about losers. Um, um, how would you rate uh, the reaction of, well, potential losers? It's a very difficult word to use in, in a geopolitical context because losers tend to become a bit gnarly when it comes to uh, becoming losers. Uh, so uh, how would you rate uh, um, the, the view of uh, very, very fossile uh, economies uh, on this change? This is interesting and this is not, well, there's not one answer and you have to look into the different countries. I see, for example, Russia moving in its new energy strategy. We are seeing Saudi Arabia looking into circular carbon economy moving forward with, with product, um, project like NEON. Um, those countries, it, for those countries, it's easier because they still have um, some the resources to spend on, on decarbonization. If you look to other states um, producing oil and natural gas like Venezuela or Angola, Nigeria, there is a different game. Um, so this, this is part where you have the, the winners and the losers situation. And again, I really see a big chance in using the, the hydrogen value chain. But there's another game going on, and I think we should also touch on that, which is the geoeconomic game. So what we're seeing is, is really um, the, the, the rivalry or let's say the race over winning technologies and innovation cycles. And this, I think, is, is a chance uh, for the European Union, for Europe, but also for European partners. And this is also very important in how to move forward with the hydrogen economy. So I think this is another dimension we should, should have in mind and, and talk about. I will uh, return to Armin. So um, Siemens um, has, of course, globally uh, a lot of clients. And many of these clients are, well, the, the usual big industry conglomerates, uh, uh, well, small and medium-sized enterprises as well. Uh, a lot of them are very dependent in their processes on a uh, few fossil, uh, fossil fuels right now, so gas, uh, oil, uh, hydrogen, NAFTA, whatever. So um, there is one thing to decarbonize or to defossilize uh, these uh, processes. The other thing, uh, so I would ask you a twofold question. First of all, how do you think these uh, um, companies can be helped meet the, the climate uh, requirements? And well, the other thing is what, what Kirsten talked about. It's the geoeconomics. It's the, the world of chances uh, of uh, new markets and new chances on developing markets. So how do you rate uh, this ratio? Uh, can, can we get both things? Can we get a, a defossilized uh, industry 
heavy industry, energy intensive industry, and at the same time uh, develop not only Germany or Europe, because we are talking to a global uh, audience here, uh, can this be a chance for new growth, uh, new jobs, uh, new development? Yeah, oh, Holger, thanks a lot. I mean, uh, a clear yes. Uh, yes, we can. I mean, there are, as you, as you were mentioning, there are two different targets and topics to, to touch here. The first one is transforming the existing industry, say the asset-based, the fossil-based industry, into a decarbonized or, say, first of all, stepwise decarbonized industry. So this is the first step. Uh, one one uh, measure by this could be the coal to gas shift, I mean, which is automatically, of course, reducing the CO2 footprint. Uh, the other one is increase the efficiency of existing power plants, for instance. I mean, we cannot expect that, I mean, similar to Germany, that around the world that we easily switch off all the coal power plants in the world. I mean, this is not possible in the short frame. It will be done in the long run, but we need to work on this transformation uh, process with all the different clients and customers in the different countries with different preconditions and prerequisites. So and this is what we do in our, say, uh, classical power and gas business. Yeah? In efficiency up, coal to gas shift, so helping them to reduce the CO2 footprint, firstly. The second one is the, you were mentioning the, the opportunity path, right? Uh, it is very important to drive costs down. I mean, um, the cost for, for hydrogen or green hydrogen strongly depends on cost for renewable electricity, which is important as well. And here we see a complete different picture compared to the first hydrogen hive we have had maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, so precondition number one, cheap electricity is, is available in many countries, which I would see they, these are the opportunity countries. Yeah, South America, what we will see in the, in the global hydrogen market that the production places will become more decentralized. I mean, the oil exporting countries by chance, very often like Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, etc., uh, even Australia, you have excellent conditions for solar and partly even wind. So they will stay in the market, shifting from fossil to, to green markets. But there are others, North Africa, Northwest Africa, South America, even Russia, uh, will play a role in, in that business. So these are getting more opportunities uh, in there. Second topic is helping to to bring the cost down is by, I mean, scaling up. We need to reduce the cost for these electrolyzers to get, say, the, the technical readiness level up. Uh, this is something we are very, very strong working on that. So helping to sum it up, not to take all the time here, helping the, say, existing industry transforming, reducing their CO2 footprint, and at the same time, in parallel, moving towards the green hydrogen opportunity, we will call it, by, I mean, investing with technology uh, development, but also with renewable electricity in markets, in countries with excellent conditions, yeah, in order to bring cost for hydrogen, blue or green or yellow, however, pink, we call it, to bring the cost down. So existing business, different way, but important to accelerate and the opportunity business, which I do see in the long run, the green hydrogen as the key opportunity, the key market. Daniel, uh, well, Australia is one of those wonderlands with amazing uh, solar radiation uh, values. Um, so you as Linde are trying to, to make a business model hydrogen and, and clean energy. So that's the, basically the name of, of your division um, in, in Australia. Can you give us a few glimpses of how you would um, see the future of uh, a clean uh, and hydrogen based 
part of the Australian economy, uh, perhaps what are the opportunities in terms of uh, renewable energy cost of electricity? And on the other hand, how are uh, well potential customers and clients of, of Linde in Australia uh, approaching you and, and how are they looking in the future? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. Happily, uh, happy to go through those different kind of opportunities we see in this market. I, I think the first and, and the most immediate and the biggest one we see will obviously be decarbonising the transport sector. You know, Australia is still heavily reliant on imports of uh, oil, oil, despite having, you know, vast reserves of natural gas. Um, many of our clients are coming to us now and, and we really see the starting point for any mobility compensation is around that uh, back to base uh, bus type transport that, that you know, you guys have already seen a lot of already in those European cities. Um, I guess the next and, and one of the ones that I'm really excited to, um, to work on is the storage piece. You know, you talk about a, a wide array of renewables available to us here in Australia. Again, they're still only available when the wind blows or when the sun shines. And, and what we're talking about is, you know, extremely high peaking power prices in the afternoon as a, as a major challenge to industry and, and particularly to the manufacturing industries. What we'd love to see is, is um, hydrogen being used as a storage mechanism to help shift that great peak of renewables we see in the middle of the day or the, the, um, you know, hydro, uh, the, uh, the wind blowing, especially in the, in the southern areas of uh, our country. Um, and shift those to when, you know, the industry is really looking for that power and when the, those households are looking to run, you know, you know the blessing of a, a great solar irradiance is, uh, is also the curse of a heavy air conditioning load. So I think that's a, a really important piece to make. And I guess the, the final um, application and, and, you know, one that I think Lindy has a great, great portfolio in and, and why I'm so excited to be working for Lindy. It's been doing hydrogen for 100 years. But the, uh, the new discussion we're having is actually about hydrogen as an export fuel. And I think Australia has already demonstrated how it can build an export uh, industry around LNG. What we're talking about now is helping to solve the rest of the world solve their um, energy problems with, uh, with regards to carbon by providing a, a carbon neutral fuel uh, across, across the water, you know, to the rest of the world. I think that's an amazing opportunity not to be discounted. Yeah, perhaps um, I would um, give this question to, to Kirsten as well. Uh, well, there is a lot of talk about a, a global liquid hydrogen market. Uh, our Ministry of the Economy here in Germany uh, says uh, oil, uh, well, hydrogen is the oil of the future. Uh, from your experience in uh, energy geopolitically, uh, can it be changed from a global oil market to a global hydrogen market that easy? No, it's, it's difficult to make these comparisons. I think Armin Schnettler made a very important point in, in saying we have more flexibility and more options with hydrogen and producing hydrogen because you can produce it from renewables. Um, you can also produce it from natural gas via steam methane reforming or pyrolysis. So what I'm trying to say is that it, there are more options and it's really also more upon choice with whom you partner and team up. And this is very important from the geopolitical and geoeconomical point of view. So it's, it's really about defining yeah, joint ventures, corporations across the whole value chain. Uh, the oil system is very different. It's basically dictated by geo geology and then infrastructure. Of course, we managed to build up a, a global system and a trading system. Uh, but this has taken some time and I, I think uh, and my hope is that a, a similar system will develop for hydrogen, but it will be very different. And there is more question about how much or how many parts of the value chain and we are talking about a very complex value chain. Um, talking from from production to storage to transmission to end use. 
And, and there are very different modules in it. And the interesting question is yet now really to define clusters and value chains and how much of the value you would like to grasp also in your own country. So, so there are many other issues related to, to really uh, choice and, and business cases and not so much uh, uh, to, to ge geology. So there are differences, yes. Well, perhaps let's look at this, uh, the market issue, the global market issue uh, a bit later. I, I, I would um, still stick a little bit with, with the technological side. Uh, I mean, um, well, Siemens has, as I mentioned, has uh, thousands of uh, clients all over the industry. Um, uh, so Daniel just came up with uh, three issues, very interesting for Australia. So for Australia itself, it's obviously that the mobility, it's a large country, heavy truck, we all have seen them on TV, racing 1,000 kilometers straight, very hard to do with uh, a battery driven uh, vehicle, uh, understandable. And the second issue is of course storage to, uh, in, in, uh, well, to make your um, energy system in Australia more more efficient. So we in, in Germany and Europe, of course, we, we look from a, from a steel perspective and we look from a, from a cement perspective and so on. Uh, so Armin, um, if you could give us a, a few um, impressions where hydrogen is going to be needed the most and where it probably is going to start be used. Uh, this is, if I would know that today, I would invest my money exactly there. But I have some, you know, some ideas. So maybe we let's float some ideas. I mean, um, definitely hydrogen, green hydrogen will be used where the, say, price willingness is the highest. As Daniel mentioned, I mean, in mobility or Kirsten, uh, the mobility is uh, something where this price sensitivity is not that high. I'm not sure what's about, you know, private cars, if we will see a really a big shift on the global scale in private cars, but definitely on, uh, on uh, say, trucks, trains, we will see, of course. So everything which is related to mobility uh, with res respect to, say, uh, um, petrol, kerosene for, for, say, shipping and, and aircraft industry, this will follow as well. But this is also related to regulation and self-commitment of the different industries. Yeah? So if you know, if you have a look on this, say, CO2 footprint of aircrafts, I mean, let's forget, of course, the corona impact on, on aircraft, on transportation, etc. But the projections we have seen in the previous year is that, I mean, there's a tremendous increase in, in air traffic. And how to cope with that, of course, we, we cannot build, although we have been in, invested in, in electric, in battery aircraft, as you may know, right? We sold it. Um, but it is, of course, an interesting topic to reduce the carbon footprint by synthetic fuels. And this is where I see the next uh, big wave, say really the, the scale up of, of the green hydrogen is for refineries, the Renewable Energy Directive 2 in, in, uh, in Europe, for instance, once this is in place, uh, then there will be a strong increase in the demand in the off-taker. And once you have the off-taker, then you will quickly see a huge number of projects. And when I'm talking about, say, hydrogen production uh, projects, then Today we are talking about a few megawatts or say a few 10 norm cubic meters or hundreds, but then we will see the 100 megawatt as Kirsten mentioned, the NEOM in Saudi Arabia. There will be others. I mean, we are in talks uh, in development in the hundreds in several hundred megawatt ranges. So this is something we will see quickly, but everything depends on the off-taker business made by price willingness made by, say, regulation or self-commitment. Perhaps I, I can add, um, well, uh, McKinsey did a, a remarkable study on, uh, on the future of a global hydrogen economy. Um, the, um, it was um, 
commissioned by by the Japanese government and and they came to the conclusion that you probably would need around 40 gigawatts uh, globally of install installed uh, production capacity to get to this scale uh, industry scale we need to get the prices down where where they become competitive towards uh, um, uh, against uh, oil and 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 gas so what what from your point of view what should happen now uh, to get us to scale I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of, of markets, to be frank. Uh, so we need the off-taker business and we need to start the kick off the off-taker business by regulation. It could be the renewable energy directive, as mentioned. It could be self-commitments, etc. So it's all about scalability, numbers. We are in a similar situation as we have been with the uh, PV industry, with the wind industry, say 15, 20 years back. And I do agree with uh, the colleagues from McKinsey. I mean, we can debate if it is 30 gigawatt, 50 gigawatt or however. I mean, um, today we have 100 gigawatts of annual installations of PV uh, on a global scale. And I'm not scared about driving costs down. I mean, it's, it's not by the, you know, by the electrolyzer. And I'm not a fan talking about green hydrogen, which is based on surplus of green electricity. I mean, this is fine maybe for some regions, uh, say Northern Germany or somewhere else, but the green hydrogen economy definitely is based on green electricity, which is newly built wherever it makes sense, where the preconditions are excellent. And then it's all about, I mean, CAPEX and OPEX for electrolyzers will automatically come down with, say, automation in, in, in production, with uh, the learning curve, are, and so with installed base. I'm, I'm very confident that we will not talk uh, about these topics in a couple of years from now, because then it is getting the new technology. It's getting, I, I don't like the, the word commodity in this respect, because they are, I mean, an, a hydrogen plant is an electrochemical plant. I mean, Daniel, you know that, right? I mean, this is, and this is even an, an, a chemical plant is something which is a commodity, at least based on the different products. And we will see the same trend in the, in the hydrogen field. Yeah, Daniel. Um, well, I think the, the South Koreans and the Japanese were globally the first to, to issue or to create uh, hydrogen strategies. So uh, in, in Germany, if you're talking about Australia, people always say, oh, they're doing uh, hydrogen with, with, uh, with lignite, with coal, and they don't do it with CO2, um, uh, with CCN and so on. Um, uh, of course, this is in Europe a, a very difficult issue. Could you give us a uh, a view on your potential markets from from you talked about export fuels so where is linda australia looking at for potential ma customers and markets and uh, uh, perhaps a, a second look on on the technology side so hydrogen from renewable what, what is your vision of of this in australia okay um thanks for the question the the uh, global energy market is obviously complex and there's plenty of players. And as you mentioned, Japan and South Korea are really big players emerging as energy importers. Um, I'm fortunate enough here in Australia to, uh, to operate the business across both Australia and New Zealand. And I think um, it's really important to talk about New Zealand in this context because New Zealand already is blessed with over 84% of its energy coming from renewable, renewable sources. And already we've seen partnerships forming um, across, you know, uh, New Zealand with many of the Japanese players. And, and we want to talk about the Tokyo Olympic Games, which I'm, uh, I'd love to talk about, despite them being delayed by COVID. Um, you know, BOC was already pa a party to a, a conglomerate that was, you know, generating renewable hydrogen uh, from our plant in, uh, in New Zealand, in Auckland there, and sending that uh, in, by bottles to the Tokyo Games and, and powering the buses, moving, moving athletes around the village. Um, I think that's a, you know, an already a great example and a great demonstration of how um, these change will form. 
I guess the the second part of your question, uh, Holger, was the um, the technology piece. And I think you know there's there's obviously kind of three front runners there if we talk about um, ammonia as, as one because we can utilize the existing LPG shipping channels we have to uh, to export that energy. Um, the obvious other ones, you know, hydrides and and um, and using those as a new and emerging technology. But the one that's probably near and dear to Lindy is the liquefaction piece where. Um, you know, it's very transferable from the existing helium business we run. Uh, we've already made investments into, you know, cabining and, and um, transport as um, around South Korea and Japan where we're, we're making liquid. Um, I think that will be a huge player in the global market and especially with the, its synergies with um, LNG, it'll, it'll be a, a large player in our region as well. Uh, perhaps uh, one question on, on transport and logistics, because you mentioned it right now. So we all know Kawasaki did the first ship. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it's uh, come to a halt right now, but it's there a, are... It's a demonstrator course, and it's, um, it's, uh, it's a Lindy liquefier, which I'm, I'm quite proud to announce. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, Siemens is probably not liking this, but okay. Um, no, but but uh, you mentioned it. There are, and and, and Kirsten mentioned it as well. Um, um, uh, um, hydrogen gives a lot more options to to use it uh, or to transport it. What what do you think from 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 a business perspective? What do you think uh, is there going to be one uh, one uh, kind of, of uh, storage or, or transport going to prevail sometime or are we going to look at a variety of, of transport and logistics uh, uh, um, um, well um, things in, in hydrogen ammonia you meant ammonia LOHC uh, liquefied uh, gasified whatever so, so what do you think is there going to be one for all or are there are you looking at a, a much larger variety? I, I think we're very much looking at a much wider variety of technologies. I think uh, Kirsten also touched on the point that it's not going to be a, a silver bullet solution. It's going to be a transition. And when we think about it as a, as a transition, we need to look at how we can repurpose those existing, I guess, sh shipping and liquefaction assets uh, and turn those into to, um, technology capable of, of exporting energy. So. Uh, I mentioned briefly before that ammonia is great because it's interchangeable with existing um, LPG uh, propane uh, for, for, you, for your, demo, uh, your geography, for existing propane assets. And I think that that's why ammonia will have a, a huge rise. But at the same time, in terms of shipping volume, you really need to look at hydrogen liquefaction. And the hydrides is very much the unknown in that, that value chain. Um, as that technology continues to evolve, you know, Lindy has a keen eye on what that will look like. And, and myself, uh, in this geography, obviously very um, interested because it allows us, uh, if, if there is a technological breakthrough, it'll quickly allow us to um, to shape up and, and ramp up that export of energy to the world. Well, perhaps let's let's spend the remainder of our time on on the the one big question: How do we get from a lot of uh, um, well, a, a lot of uh, fantasy, a lot of uh, vision, and a lot of goodwill uh, into a real global market which can cater for all needs of, of uh, industries around the globe uh, to defossilize. Uh, I, I would like to, to start uh, with Kirsten. Uh, so you are looking from a, from a, from an academic position on on uh, on industry economy uh, and politics so what would be your recipe uh, if, you, if, if you could you could rule for one day how could world get um, on this path rather quickly and the most efficient I don't have a recipe yet I think what we've done right now was to identify the necessary ingredients and we've seen that this takes place on, on many stages and in, in many acid, acid, um, as, um, situations. Um, I think um, what is very important is that we have to move on quickly 
And we have to use the hype that also Armin and, and Daniel mentioned. And it's now on the agenda. It's now really um, urgent to, to realize it. And I think there is a sense of urgency um, across the world, um, looking into climate change, looking into the Paris Agreement. So this is why I think this time it's different, the wave of hydrogen. Plus, you also have the point of green recovery and green stimulus programs. So I think it's a very important step to include this into the stimulus packages across the world um, and energy transformation as such. So um, it, 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 there's not this, this one way recipe. I think we have to define different ingredients and cook different meals <laughs> to stay in, in this picture um, um, and move on with identifying clusters and value chains. So it's, it's in, in a one step, it's about bilateral relationships also, importing, exporting um, relationships. But of course, and, and this is maybe also your point why you are addressing that to me, of course we need multilateral governance as well. So we have to get a better understanding about life cycles and emissions if we really want to achieve a low carbon or, or carbon neutral energy system. So there's a lot to do, but this is not one way. There's not one recipe, but different levels have to move and, 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 and fall together. But it's really about a scaling up of opportunities. That's, that's what I think. Yeah, taking uh, away on, on, on Kristen's um, words, um, so what, what I've learned until now from our discussion is that we probably will not get a, a, well, a one-to-one -one, uh, exchange from oil and gas to hydrogen, which means there's going to be, as always, when, when new technologies come into play, there's going to be a lot of disruption economical disruption, possibly political disruption as well. So my question to, to Armin uh, would be, um, if, we, if we think about hydrogen as a, the oil of the future, as politicians sometimes say, and I said this myself, but more for a, a illustrative uh, purpose, um, uh, then of course we think that things stay the same. We just use a different tool. Uh, if I sum up our discussion, this is not going to happen. So what do you see as potential shift of value creation change? So um, um, some people from the chemical industry ask me, so if the Saudis are doing green hydrogen, why should they ship it to us and don't they do ammonia themselves then? So is there, from your perspective, uh, a, a large disruption and a larger shift of possible markets and value creation uh, patterns uh, ahead of us? Um, I mean, the two questions, I mean, at least in there, right? Uh, I mean, the, the Saudi case, I mean, why shouldn't, uh, why should they? Uh, I mean, they, they ship oil today, right? And in, instead of, uh, I mean, going along the value chain, or, although they do. Yeah, so it's not either or, it's always, I mean, both or all, all solutions. I mean, whenever there is a market and whenever there is a business behind, uh, then there will be something happening. And this will the same uh, will be the case in, in the hydrogen. Um, what's about the, the disruption? We are already in the disruption, right? Uh, I mean, we call it uh, energy transition or transforming energy systems, etc. But what we are going to do is that the basis of the world's economy is now shifting from the fossil industry to the green industry. You know, Siemens Energy, we, we are in that business for a very long time. We are in we, we are still in the, in the coal business, in the gas business, say fossil, the, the natural gas uh, turbines. And we, we feel a huge pressure on our traditional business by renewables. Now, if you have a look on the projections for the, for the gas turbine markets, the last large gas turbines, five years ago, we would see today, say, maybe 400 gas turbines to be sold a year. In fact, it is much less than 100, just in order to give a rough figure, it's less than that. 
And this is due to this energy transition, right? And the same what we are doing now is we see a strong shift from coal, from even from gas to green, say, uh, power, plus the sector coupling. So we, we take it in a different way. We don't see it as a threat because they are our existing customer base and install asset base. We are trying to help our customers to go along that way. And in addition, I mean, taking the opportunity in the green energy market, in the hydrogen market, while, I mean, bringing up or founding up a new entity, a new unit, which is new energy business, focusing on exactly that field. Maybe to sum it up, what, what do we need for that? We need to stimulate the off-taker, right? Because without off-taker, so without a business, we talked about this, we cannot come into the scaling. And scaling here means, of course, the technology of the, say, green hydrogen production unit, call it that way, in order to avoid electrolyzer, right? But on top, there is the green electricity market because you need wind and solar, so which is coming on top. And this is creating, say, um, markets, jobs in all countries, in all areas where we have excellent, excellent climatic conditions, so to speak. And by that, ending up what Kirsten and Daniel mentioned as well is we need, say, cooperation, partnerships, international partnerships, even government to government business, which is the basis in order to, to stimulate. And then we are back in the beginning. Yeah, so this is the three topics. If we manage that, uh, we, we all, I'm pretty sure we all will take advantage out of that. Yeah, thank you. I think our time is up. Um, I thank you very much for this uh, really good and uh, deep discussion. I think the hydrogen um, hype is here to stay because it's not a hype anymore. It's a new necessity from the goals uh, you gave itself on uh, tackling climate protection. And, and therefore, uh, we really look forward. And um, I'm very glad to see um, our uh, participants from, from the industry look at this as a forward going chance, even if they have some, um, so some fossil or other parts in, in the value creation chain. And uh, uh, our hope is that uh, discussing this with politicians, with politics and governments will really uh, lead to what uh, Armin said in the end. So uh, a world where multilateral cooperation uh, is leading way and uh, technology is helping us to overcome the problems we see today. With that, I thank you all for participating from Australia, from Germany, from the rest of the world. And I wish you a good day. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you.